Hello, I'm Terry Geidish. Like you, I'm wild about Washington. Are you ready to try family camping for the first time? It requires some homework before you head to the woods. You need to do it right or you will have unwanted visitors. Here's a novice campsite set up at Northwest Trek. The results will give you an idea of what we mean. We're standing inside the Black Bear exhibit, but it looks quite different than it normally would. We have a, a camp set up in here, and it was set up by some novice campers who didn't know how to set up in bear country and how to be bear savvy. They've made a lot of mistakes here. First mistake is they left their food unattended. There's no one around. Also, another mistake they've made, their food area is right next to their camping area. Also, there are smelly food items out. There's bacon, there's hot dogs, there's fish. These people are not really savvy on smelly items attracting bears. Also, their restroom facilities are right next to their camping area. Again, another dangerous situation. So these folks have really set themselves up for a problem to have some unwanted visitors in their campsite. Well, what we'd like to do now is actually give you a chance to see what the bears will do given the right set of circumstances and given the mistakes that these novices have made. So we'll let the bears out and we'll see what happens. saw a moment ago in the video how the bear found every little piece of food in that exhibit and that's really if you look at this skull you can see that the bears it, it's all nose uh, the nose is its most primary organ and uh, if you look inside here you can see what these are called turbinates inside there and they've got about a hundred times as many smelling surface area as humans do and it makes their sense of smell just absolutely incredible inside here is is what's called a Jacobson organ and so the bear is actually tasting scent in the air and so that really is unfathomable to to humans it elevates their olfaction to just astronomical proportions for what we're used to uh, and, and their sense of smell is about seven times as great as as a bloodhound so if, if you ask yourself do you think a bear could smell this it, it, the bear can smell that. If you're wondering how far uh, a bear could smell a potential food source, I'd say if the, if the wind was right and the bear was right in its position, it could smell your food up to three miles away. Uh, I don't think people need to f fear bears at all. I think uh, prevention is the best advice that we can give. 
just a few steps to take will will greatly increase your security and the bear security. You know, it's simple things putting putting your your um, latrine site away from your campsite where your your tent is, uh, putting the food source where you're going to be cooking a hundred yards from where you're going to be sleeping. Uh, if you're if you're cooking, those odors are going inside your clothes. Those clothes are now contaminated. You shouldn't be sleeping in those clothes. So once you get that frame of mind, a, a, a bear will smell anything that's out there. Um, if you take steps to avoid that, you're not going to run into any problems. Summer means fishing in Washington. And while the ocean salmon season is getting the publicity, lakes in eastern Washington offer you adventures as well. Um, we came out today to catch bluegill, crappie, pumpkin seed sunfish. Um, those are great entertainment for the kids and, and great for the adults as well. Those kind of fish are, uh, are perfect to get out and uh, catch yourself a meal and also entertain yourself for several hours out here. Uh, they're not the biggest fish in the world. They're not going to rival with a 40-pound Chinook salmon, but uh, as sport goes with light gear, they're just fantastic. Uh, we manage a number of the lakes around the Spokane area for warm water species, crappie, bluegill, uh, pan, all the panfish species. Um, and, and this one right that we're on out here today is Silver Lake. Probably the best, most versatile lure you can use for panfish is a, what we call a mini jig, like this one here. Uh, these will catch bluegill, crappie, perch, bass, and today we caught tinch on them even. Um, they're, uh, I've caught steelhead on them. I know guys who fish for salmon with them. I've caught cutthroat trout on them. They're just almost attractive to almost every species of fish. Uh, for the bluegill, we've added a little bit of uh, flash with this spinner here, uh, mainly though because we're fishing for the bluegill in shallow water, and this uh, makes the lure run a lot shallower. We're catching the crappie today in about 10 to 15 feet of water, and so we need our jig to sink, so we're using a 16th ounce jig that'll sink fairly fast and not get blown around too much by the wind. But in the shallow water here, you use this little spinner and it rides up close to the surface and the bluegill just come up and uh, hammer it when it rides over the top of them. For the shallow water, we just throw this thing out and re immediately start reeling it back, keep it up above the weeds. These fish, the pan fish that we're after today, are plentiful. They're certainly not endangered, so you don't have to worry about uh, harming a population of them, uh, but the main reason I like to catch them is because they're a lot of fun and they're good to eat. This is a real easy way to get started fishing and the way we're using these spinners and jigs today is not the only way you can catch them. You can catch these same fish on just a piece of bait, uh, throw out an anchor, find the fish of course is the most important thing, but once you locate some fish, put an anchor out and drop some bait, a piece of worm or something on the bottom and, and they're eager to hit that too. We definitely recommend it for kids and adults, kids of all ages, but, but especially a good a way to introduce youngsters to fishing. These fish out here are economically really important to the small communities around these lakes. Uh, they draw a lot of anglers in, they buy boat fuel, they buy food to eat, uh, they buy tackle to come out and catch them. So uh, we see these fish as, as not only a great resource for, for sport, but also economically very important to the small communities surrounding them. How about that, Jim? What's that? Crappie fishing. Yeah. Not such a bad thing. Not a bad deal at all. <laughs> Whoever's managing this lake, I'll tell you, he's doing a heck of a job. job huh? <laughs> yeah. I say give him a raise. Speaking of managing a lake, we're on the big lake, Washington's biggest lake, out here on the Pacific Ocean. We're fishing out of Westport today on the central Washington coast with veteran skipper Steve Westrick on the Hula Girl. And uh, Steve, uh, we're looking for a very healthy uh, salmon fishery this summer. Uh, when would you advise the public to think about coming down here to fish? The rest of uh, the month of July should be absolutely great and our season should run even into August and hopefully beyond, but July is a great month for uh, the, the nice big kings that we catch out here, so we're looking forward, really looking forward to it. There you heard it from one of Westport's experts. Better get down to the Washington coast and have some fun salmon fishing this summer. 
To control an unwanted fish species in an eastern Washington lake, we planted a predator that is valued by anglers as a prize catch. Silver Lake is one of 10 lakes in the state that has been planted with tiger muskies. Now, tiger muskies have been planted for a couple reasons. One, to provide a new kind of exciting and exotic sport fishery, and two, to uh, be used as what we call a biological control. Instead of uh, using the old technique of rote noning lakes and to get rid of unwanted fish, we're, we're trying to use tiger muskies to lower the populations of unwanted species. For example, here in, in Silver Lake, we want to lower the population of uh, tench, which in Europe are a popular sport fish, but people here in Washington don't seem to care too much for them. We use three different primary techniques for capturing fish when we're out here doing a survey like this. We use electroshock boat, which I'm sitting in. We also use gill nets and uh, fike nets, where, which are a type of trap net. Uh, we take all the fish that we catch, regardless of how we catch them. We weigh them and measure them. We take scale samples to see uh, how fast they're growing and how old they are. And then with the muskies, in addition to that, we also pump their stomachs to see what they're eating. We have three primary objectives in the tiger muskie study. We want to see what effect they're having on the fish community in general. We also want to look at their growth and survival rate. And we want to see specifically what they're eating. So we want to see if they're targeting on the fish that we hope that they'll eat in the lakes that we've put them into. When the muskies were planted here in Silver Lake last June, they averaged a size of about 12 to 13 inches. Right now, they're averaging about 17 to 23 inches. Now, they seem to be growing pretty good. Minimum legal size for keeping a muskie in Washington state is 36 inches. Uh, the reason the 36 in inch minimum was put into place here in Washington, it sounds like an awfully big fish, and it is, but muskies grow to be quite large. I believe the world record for a tiger muskie is 52 pounds. So a 36 inch fish would probably weigh about 10 pounds. Now we want them to get that big primarily so it gives them a chance to do what we, they were put into the lake to do, i.e. eat tench in the case of Silver Lake. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching.